Well, let's switch it to women, because I always <laughs> love talking about women in politics. And speaking about that, we have Keisha Ron here today. Um, so Keisha is a University of Vermont alum, as well as a former Vermont legislator, and is a founding member of Emerge Vermont, which recently had a gala and aims to change the face of Vermont politics by identifying, training, and inspiring women of all backgrounds to pursue politics or public office, just in general. So welcome, Keisha. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, it's wonderful to have you. Yeah. This is a really historic show as well. I was just watching a clip from the Sherry and Yolanda show in the 90s and just thinking how much we've come full circle and your makeup looks great everything looks <laughs> great but also um i'm just honored to be your guest on our first episode Yay. and you are working those bonus points thank you so much <laughs> you, you did bring us a gift but you did bring us like a compliment so yeah. it's like that's a gift in itself and right, flattery yeah. will get you everywhere you know. everywhere there's plenty of room on that couch <laughs> So for those who don't know, how did you initially get into politics? Yeah, so, uh, you know, sometimes I go back to fifth grade when there were no girls running for student council president, and I thought that was a huge tragedy, and ran and won. Uh, but fast forward many years, uh, I was student body president at the University of Vermont. And in fact, I'm only the seventh woman in the 75 year history of the student government to be president of the UVM SGA. Really? And a lot of men asked me to be their vice presidential candidate. And I said, well, I think I'd be really great at being president. <laughs> and you could be my vice president if you'd like. Uh, and the rest is sort of history. I learned a lot from that experience about what it feels like to be uh, a woman in politics. There's a difference in how you're treated and perceived, um, how people might approach your leadership. And um, I started to feel like I could use a lot of support. And I reached out to women like Governor Madeline Kunin and a friend of mine who uh, had been the graduate student senate president and run for the legislature, Rachel Weston. And uh, they incurred, they said, look, you're student body president, you teach preschool locally, you're on a number of boards and commissions, you may not realize this, but you're qualified to run for the legislature. And that's one of the biggest barriers women often face, is not feeling qualified enough to run for something. Wow. And so I'm guessing this leads into Emerge Vermont, which you are a founding member alongside Madeline Kunin. That's right. And you started in her living room. That's right. So uh, I had been in the legislature by then three years or so. And in fact, you'll love this story. When I first went to meet with Governor Kunin about running for the legislature, I was 21. And I don't know what possessed me, but I showed up to her office in a hoodie, jeans, and flip-flops. This was to meet with the former governor of the state, an incredibly fabulous, elegant woman. And uh, she was very kind to me and generous and even offered to endorse me wearing a hoodie and jeans. Um, and a couple of years later, she came to the state house. I was in a skirt suit, and she leaned over and she said, you clean up very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> she was very gracious to me, but that's one of the many reasons we thought we needed Emerge Vermont is because young women or women of all stripes and backgrounds don't really know uh, what it's like to dress like you're gonna run for office, to speak and act like you're ready to run for office. So Governor Kunin had traveled to California to speak at Emerge California, one of the first Emerge America organizations and came back and said, we need something longer than Emily's List, which is a couple day training or, you know, just an afternoon for ready to run. We need a program that's months long and really gets women who are committed to running. And uh, so far we've had almost 100 women go through the program, 13 women run for office, and many of those women be successful, including uh, the Senate uh, Majority Leader, Becca Ballant, in the Vermont State Senate. Awesome. And the House Majority Leader is also a female, correct? The House Majority Leader, Jill Krowinski, is yeah. on our advisory council, was also in Governor Kunin's living room when we started the organization. <laughs> so we're a force to be reckoned with, and we're three years in. That's amazing. It is. And it seems like there can there's a lot getting done in one living room. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think sometimes it's important to take a step back and think about why is it important for women to be in government at all? And I'm often speaking to other young women who look at the political battlegrounds and see a lot of mudslinging and don't think there's a real place for them. They don't want to be attacked publicly. And I try to remind them that they have to look at it 
just through the numbers, that of all the elected officials in the country, less than 5% are under the age of 35. And of that 5%, about a quarter, so 1.5% of that total, are women under the age of 35. Now guess who gets to Congress and makes a lot of laws about young women's bodies? There's a huge bottleneck of people who make it to Congress. They started in politics under the age of 35, over half of them, and most of them are white, Christian, and male. And who do they like to make laws about? Young women and their bodies. And so if we don't start women running and thinking about their own capacity to serve at the school board, the city council, the board of alder people, uh, and then make it all the way to the legislature and Congress and beyond, we will never have that pipeline to finally break the glass ceiling. So besides just the, um, you know, maybe people feeling that they're not qualified enough to run, yeah. what else is kind of restricting them? That's a great question. Women are just, have different expectations set up for them in society. If you're a man who has young kids, nobody is asking you every day, oh, how are your kids doing and are they gonna be okay without you? You know, even Sue Minter running for governor with one uh, student in high school and one who was in college was asked, is this okay for your kids? You know, and they're grown people. So uh, women often have this double standard in terms of what are they neglecting at home to run for office. Another barrier they face is also fundraising. Um, a lot of people are very encouraging of women to run, but they don't open their checkbooks as much as men open their checkbooks for other men. So that emerges also not just trying to help women run, but create that culture of women supporting other women. I feel like, um, you know, sort of when Sue ran for governor and you ran for lieutenant governor last summer, um, you didn't seem to have too hard of a time fundraising. You kept up with, you know, um, the other people who were running. That's right. Um, and so was that, do you think, partially thanks to Emerge or? The, the attitude has entirely changed between Emily's List, Emerge, and a number of other organizations. I think that's a really astute point. And it, it also makes us have to rethink what those barriers are for women, right? Because mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton, for example, spent $1.4 billion running for president and couldn't break through a lot of different barriers, including a big layer of misogyny, you know, that was, was overlaying the, the whole entire experience. So. Um, we still do have a culture that has to change and see women as executive leaders. And I think regardless of how much money we raise, that will still be a barrier. But you're right, we're getting a lot more women and men, great men, to think about uh, supporting women. And you know, I remember <laughs> you giving me uh, your, your big check from your <laughs> campaign account. Um, and so you know, I just think it's going to take all kinds of folks supporting women candidates. Not yes. that you're a size queen, but like <laughs> she just wanted to focus on that it was a, a, a large check for you. Yeah. Large. Well, I think I think the biggest thing too um, that I noticed last summer was um, how they were the media always seemed kind of surprised that you know yourself and Sue were doing so well with fundraising. Right. And I, that always kind of like you know what what role does the media have in all of this as well? That's a great question. I think we're all still unpacking it just from the election and then we're dealing with the shell shock of the health care bill that just passed the House, uh, the U.S. House that you know, literally treats women like a pre-existing condition, and, and the Women's March, which was the largest demonstration in U.S. history. And the media is still so far behind in creating visibility for women and letting them be, I think, the star of their own narrative. So often, right, it's, it's framed in how are other men doing compared to this woman, or, um, you know, is she keeping up with the boys? And, you know, I think uh, hopefully the more women that run and the more women of all beliefs and you know they could be conservative, liberal. It doesn't matter. We need to see that women aren't monolithic, and that we really do have, um, you know, our own path forward individually. Absolutely. And speaking of the most recent election, are we seeing more women coming into politics, running for local government? So here's the great news. Uh, <laughs> Emily's list usually has about 900 to 1,000 women who uh, express interest, sign up for their programs, say they're interested in running for office. Um, this year so far, and it's only May, they have 11,000 women who are interested in running across the country. That's wow. Emerge America, uh, we have 11 or 12 states that we're in. That's going to double this year. Um, so we're going to not only have the interest, but the infrastructure to help women run starting very soon.
Wow. What, what's the next? What's like? What's the next? I'm so sort of out of it right now. But like, so we're kind of in an off cycle right now. But what is the next? Um, there's like some big. Um, there's a city council election coming up or no? What What am I missing out on? Yes, right, right here in Burlington. Okay. Um, there's a Ward Seven special election for a okay. city councilor who's stepping down. Um, there was a woman who ran in the Democratic primary. It was a caucus, so 100 people came out one night to pick the Democratic candidate. And there was a woman who ran who came to the Emerge event and was inspired. And she was a great candidate, you know, got up there. It was her first time sort of breaking into politics. Lorraine Carter Lovejoy. And that was great to see that Emerge is inspiring people whether or not they cross the finish line. Uh, the man who is our Democratic nominee now, Ali Dang, would be the first new American of African origin to serve on the city council if he wins. So, you know, it's whether it's women or people who are just underrepresented in a right. lot of different ways, it's exciting to see so many people say, you know, we need a change and I am the one I've been waiting for. I can't look behind my shoulder for somebody else to come along. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome to see that, you know, if it's not going to be a female uh, representing that seat, that potentially it could be a new American. That'd be amazing. Right. Young person. I yeah. mean, you name it. There, I mean, we saw the picture of Donald Trump with those interchangeable white men behind him after that health care vote. Um, and that was so distressing for so many people. I think they're finally s realizing they're not represented in government unless they stick their neck out and, and put a stake in the ground for what representative democracy should look like. Well, that's something that the Drag Queen League of Voters would definitely be down <laughs> for. <laughs> um, Standing up. Is that what's next? We're going to get a drag queen in the house? or? You know, that would be incredible. I was just going to say, I mean, you're the next generation, so we need you to step up and lead and be visible. Um, I, my uh, legislative seat has um, gone to Brian China, um, oh, yeah. who, DJ. Yeah, who, you know, asked me when he was starting, do you think it's okay if I wear heels and scarves sometimes to the state house? And I said, you know, it doesn't matter if it's okay. I started wearing saris and Indian clothing to the state house, whether or not it was okay with anybody. And even those small symbolic changes make a huge difference. Um, but I've been really heartened to see more queen visibility around the country, reading to kids, taking over public spaces, um, having shows like this. So I would hope and believe the next step is for one of you or both of you to run for office. <laughs> well, I've been there and done Not that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was speaking to Brenda Keith at the Pride Center Gala, and they were talking about how they're organizing a, a, a drag, drag queen, queen at, at the, the State, State House Day. Do you Yay. know anything about this? I feel excluded. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be there. Yeah, she's um, she's working on it. I don't know. It's going to be next session, I think. But oh, um, yeah, it's just going to be. We don't have a date, but we, we do have a booking. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's important. Yes, that's um, all about that coin girl. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's exciting that um, she wants to just have you know um, really a, di a diverse representation at the state house that day, obviously, but. Um, for there to be loads of drag queens. So I think a lot of people will You'll welcome you with, with open arms. I would love to come with, and they'll, it'll make a few people uncomfortable. And that's a really <laughs> oh, good thing. I love that. That's I do my that favorite so well. thing to do. Yes. So. <laughs> um, so let's put the focus on you. You are our guest on the first episode. Oh, thank so you. growing up, I mean, you always, it seems like you had this leadership goal growing <laughs> up. So young Keisha, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Oh, wow. Well, um, you know, I just, it, it's, it's Teacher Appreciation Day, or at least it's the anniversary of last year's Teacher Appreciation Day. So my first grade teacher just wrote to me on Facebook, and it was a really beautiful reminder of, I think, where I got my start, really speaking up. Um, my grandmother, who uh, came to the United States from India, taught me how to read and write at a very young age. So I could write in cursive and take dictation from the age of three on. And so when I got to first grade, uh, I was a bit precocious and I was also uh, troubled. We, I had come from a really difficult past. My parents hadn't had a good relationship. My father was abusive and they were starting to split up. So, you know, I was a smart kid but had a really broken uh, home life. And my uh, first grade teacher, Miss Donahoe, was a very no-nonsense Irish woman. And um, she would teach us Irish jigs and I got a little bit more interested in school because I could sing and do whatever I wanted. 
And um, then she realized that even though I was a troubled kid, I could read and I could write pretty well. And there were a lot of kids in the class who came from other countries, um, especially from Mexico, who were really struggling. And so she said, you know, you have a great responsibility with this privilege that you have of, of language to take those other kids outside and teach them how to read. So, uh, you know, instead of having me just sit in the class and be disruptive, she had me take all those kids one by one outside and teach them how to read, which allowed me to walk a mile in their shoes and understand that many of them spoke multiple other languages that they had so much to offer and that those simple barriers often kept people from knowing and understanding who they were. And so it ultimately made me a better person uh, that she gave me that opportunity. And so I think about that when I think of, of all the people, all the Vermonters and Americans and people uh, in general who can make a huge difference in somebody's life just by um, seeing a gift or a talent they have and, and helping them access it themselves, believe in, believing in someone else before they believe in themselves. I've had a lot of those people in my life and so I try to turn around and do that for others. So I was expecting, like, I wanted to be a doctor, or, <laughs> but I love the motivation of just a bigger goal of yeah. being an awesome human being. And That's all we can ever hope to be, right? Yeah. Or Fabulous. a queen. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, right. Exactly. I tried that. And it didn't. You did? Well, yeah. So, <laughs> dressing as Belle from Beauty and the Beast on uh, Moji's last show. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was lovely, but I'm really terrible at fake eyelashes. So I think I'm just going to stick to being Although they look me. amazing on you, I have to say. Um, so you're off to Cambridge this summer. I'm off to Cambridge. Yeah. Yes. So what are you up to there? Uh, I am finally, after eight years in the legislature, my entire 20s spent in the legislature, going to take a break and go get a master's degree in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government. Um, and it's just an incredible opportunity, especially while all of the Obama team and a lot of people from Washington are creating a mass exodus from Washington and going <laughs> back to academia. Uh, so UN Ambassador Samantha Power will be a professor, Chief Economic Advisor Jason Furman, even UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon uh, will be there teaching. So it'll just be a really exciting time to be with people from around the world, really. And we know today, um, we uh, the moderate candidate in France, Macron, was elected president. So, um, you know, we can we can all rest a little bit easy that France didn't <laughs> follow in the U.S. and, and the U.K.'s footsteps. But, um, you know, we have uh, a lot of work to do to think about the direction not only of our state and our nation, but our entire globe and uh, world order. So it's a tall order, but I hope to get to the Kennedy School and be able to find some answers and bring them back to Vermont. Is that a is that a one year program or two? What, just one year. So then you'll be back to Vermont. I will be back to okay, Vermont. Yeah. <laughs> With m master plans yes, of action, exactly. I'm sure. <laughs> so are you going to share these master plans or are these a secret that we have to... Or they're going to probably develop, I'm guessing, right? You I know, mean... my biggest focus and hopefully everybody's focus is let's just save the country. Let's <laughs> make sure that we're all here in a year and we're represented and we're heard um, and we have a country to save at all. So that's what I'm focused on. Awesome. <laughs> well, I think that is it on time. That is awesome. <laughs> well, we are so happy that we had you today. Yes. Oh, thank uh, this is amazing. Thank this you for your honor. inspiring words and just all around bubbly personality. Thank you for having me. I just had to keep up with the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> flattery, flattery. <Yay! laughs> we need to cut the camera because we need to get into this right now. <laughs> <laughs> and that blush is popping through right now. Awesome. awesome. Well, thanks, Keisha. And thank um, thanks for tuning in to The Tea.